I was very much an atheist materialist, meaning I believed what we could observe. I had had a moment that made me reject atheism and made me believe that there was something else out there, that, that that love that I had experienced with my newborn child had a source. And I was trying to find a church that would fit my social needs instead of saying, all right, does God have a church that he'd like me to join? <laughs> the experience of, of having kids is, you know, has been mind-blowing for me. Growing up as an only child, for a long time I, I didn't even think I wanted to have kids. I defeated the duet kids with all of my life. So people are definitely going to know that's a pony when you say that. When people talk about the challenges of having five little kids, but it's nothing. It's nothing compared to just the joy of being surrounded by these awesome, interesting, crazy <laughs> little people. I mean, it's, it's never a dull moment. How have you adjusted to having so many little kids? Yeah, I mean, yeah, me, it's, it's, it's wildly real. different now. <laughs> But it, to me, it's all fun, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, I love having uh, a lot of kids, and I love having um, just a lot of people around, and, and I just find it to be um, fantastic. Suddenly, I was surrounded by life. And I think that that's the big thing, like, since we've become Catholic, it's just been an explosion of life everywhere. My name is Jennifer Fulweiler. I'm a writer, and I'm an atheist to Catholic convert. Lane stubbed her toe and it did scrape it a little. Look, Kate, what do you think is wrong with uh, Lane's toe? Mm. Mm. Uh, okay, 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 she won't touch it. Here, all right, let me put this Band-Aid on. And she is extremely sensitive, so I thought she may have had like a limb ripped off. If you wear your Hello Kitty slippers, I think that, that those will feel really good on your hurt toe, okay? Yeah. Like the screaming was very intense. All right, that'll make it feel all better. It's almost like a party, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just fun when you have a party with a big turnout and um, our family party has a, a pretty big turnout so far. We are headed to take the girls to Mother's Day Out and we're late as always and um, we are just scrambling to get out of here so that we can get there and then after that we will do a little homeschooling. Hey, okay, dress down. <laughs> So I get asked a lot what it's like to have five little kids. My oldest is seven, we have five, and it is, it is very, very hard. Oh gosh, guys, we're going to be late. Um, okay, everybody buckle. I'm back on. Mommy, I'm back on myself. Oh Mommy. good, Kate, you're such a big girl. Sip of coffee before we begin. Right. The chaos of having five little kids is like crazy to me and they're always yelling. Someone's always, why is someone always yelling in this house? I don't understand it, but someone is always yelling pretty much 24 hours a day. What is going on? What's going on back there? Are you animals? What, what, what's, what's the problem? I need a tour bus because this like everyone packed in like sardines, it's just, it, we constantly fight and yell and tattle, like that is how we get from one place to another, is everyone just fighting and tattling and yelling, and we need some space, but the only way to have enough space for all these kids would be if we had like some massive tour bus squirrel in the road, oh my gosh. Uh, I tried to slam on the brakes, but um, I think we might have hit it. I feel really, really bad about that. There's a bunch of animals around here, like deer and stuff, so I mean, I guess it could have been worse if it could have been a deer, but um, I just, that always really bums me out. I, I really like animals. Okay. Kate, 
hesitate, wait right over here, but don't cross the red line, okay? Sometimes it just feels stressful to have that pressure on you of like, you're the big family in the grocery store. But um, I think in general, I, I feel proud. It's, um, I kind of like it that we're doing something a little different. And, you know, when, when you go against the grain, I mean, sometimes, you know, that, that is going to catch people's attention. So it's, it is very, very hard. But yet, you know, when I compare it to the life Joe and I used to live when we lived downtown and we had a fancy car and we traveled all the time and we could sleep in, I can honestly say, truly, that I don't miss it and that I have never missed it for a minute, even with as hard as our lives are now. You know, speaking of big family life, you being such a neat freak, sometimes I'm surprised that you are okay with like everything that goes on in our house, especially um, like when it comes to potty training. Joey last night was, uh, we were talking about your, um, your potty training ideas and that uh, yeah, you think Pammy's probably about ready to be potty trained, right? Pammy is already, I mean, put her on the pot. Yeah. And uh, with her diaper on. Yeah. And she's gotten where she walks over to the pot. She knows what it's there for. Really? Mm -hmm. Yaya, she loves potty training. It's really, it's kind of a charism, really. And um, she, uh, she, she's actually decided Pammy, who's 14 months old, is past time, really, for potty training. Now, but like, the thing is, I mean, my, look, here, my thing is, you know, with a kid that young, she might have an accident. If her mom and dad will keep putting pull-ups on her, she'll get the message. I put diapers on her, not pull-ups. No, but she's got the idea, but a lot of times when children start walking, yeah, that's when they, right, they start going toward the potty. And she's also big on kids learning independence, and so she teaches them to empty the potty chairs by themselves and, and take it to the restroom. And I remember, I don't well, even remember. First, you have to start with why is it not in the restroom in the first place? She <laughs> takes them out into the living room, the potty chair. Right. And then she takes the kid and puts the kid on the potty chair. Don't forget the, the cookie. In front of the television with the cookie. That's <laughs> right. what she does. That's her method. And sometimes food does drop in there. So we, then, we have had to teach the kids you do not get food that drops in there. So then yeah. the kid eventually tinkles or whatever, and then they get up. And then so yeah, I was like, good job. Now you take that and toddle into that <laughs> bathroom and pour it into yeah. the lift. Don't forget to lift up the sink or the lid with one hand. You know, it's, just, it's <laughs> so. Two year old. Yeah. Like, but, I, but I do believe that the fact she's 18 months old, she oh. Here, but like I just, you know, you know how like when you're trying to potty train a kid that little, how like a lot of times they'll have an accident on the carpet. I mean, that's like I, did, I, I, you know, I almost pass out. Like Joe, Joe has never come closer to passing out. I think than one time when he walked in from work to see our two-year-old toddling. Like there is sloshing going on, and then they're like looking at the TV while holding the potty chair. And I mean, I, I just about had to get a fainting couch for Joe during during potty training. It's it's it is always a really rough season, especially now that Yaya lives there. So she really kind of sets up the potty training regime at, at our house and is not super interested in our feedback. I mean, she she has it down. When they get up first thing in the morning, you put them on the pot. When they get up from the nap, you put them on the pot. Well, how do you get them to stay on the pot? I mean, they, well, they she just... does, she does. Really? I'm you more, just tell I'm, her to stay? She no, does. you just sit her there and it's just common instinct. She just knows to. Really? But I, we've already been going through this. Now that she has her own house 10 blocks away, we can kind of segregate the potty training you know, to over there. So it's better. Yeah. It's a lot better. Yeah, I do. And every now and then. Once I got so mad, remember I, I what was it? <laughs> I, I, I took the potty chair and I ran out the front door to like throw it somewhere, but I couldn't figure out where to throw it. And so, so like I went, I, 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 so I ran around to the side of the house and I threw it over our own fence into our own backyard because I didn't know what else to do. And, um, <laughs> Because I mean, my mom and I have been fighting about this, you know, so long, so many times about this, like potty chairs in the living room thing. But I finally just, and then after I did that, I felt so stupid that I just never said anything about it a, a, again. What did our neighbors think? Like, you run out, pause. Yeah. I know it was early. It was like 8 a.m. on a Saturday or something, you know. And it was cold. It was like winter, you know. Oh, that was terrible. She wow. knows to sit there. Now, at what age can they empty their own? Do you think? Because well, I, I don't, that's gross to me, like well, taking I, that thing. Well, I don't worry about that. I'd gladly empty, I'd rather empty a potty than to change a fuzzy diaper. <laughs> right. So, empty the potty is no problem. Yeah. But, uh, but she already. 
knows what he's there for. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I got pictures of her climbing on it and standing in the sand. Yeah. yeah. And it upsets children. Oh, what? Oh, standing in the potty? Yeah, but it's all clean. I well, clean them really good. <laughs> well, I've, I have a picture from when we were potty training the other girls where you, you or somebody had used one of our potty chairs as a cup holder. So there was like a cup of water sitting in the potty chair. And, and then I guess someone was just, you know, drinking out of it. Well, I guess that, that could be one of the kids. Yeah. Had, you know, like, like the other day, Yaya said something about like, oh yeah, you know, one of the kids, yeah, she, she loves that potty chair, but she was talking about her five-year-old. So I <laughs> guess the potty chair really, oh, yeah. well actually she, she has a friend. I mean, Yaya really sees the potty chair is, it is a portable place to use the restroom for all ages. There, there's no, <laughs> You know, there's no reason to, con you know, confine it and think inside the box. You have to be a toddler, you know. Um, and so she actually had a friend who used to go square dancing, and she liked to get good parking, and she'd arrive early, but then she couldn't get in to use the restroom. And so she would keep a potty chair um, in the back of her truck, and she, and then that way she could just use. I don't that. think it was a truck. I, I think it was like a suburban or something. Suburban, in the yeah. story, I mean, I've only heard the story once because I made it clear I did not want to hear any more <laughs> similar stories. So this is the Westgate. I actually haven't been here in almost, I guess, seven or eight years at this point. And I have a lot of memories in this building, many of them good. We lived on the 21st floor. We had this gorgeous view of West Austin that looked all the way out into the hill country. You know, we had the gym with the sauna and the doorman and the uh, 25th floor roof that had this entertainment area and the pool. And you'd go from this really dark hallway with no windows to Boom, just light and hills and clouds in the sky. And uh, that, that was always so much fun to have guests over to our house here. This is also where we had our wedding reception that lasted until 8 a.m. the day after our wedding. We were on the, the 25th floor roof and, and it actually made just a great place for entertaining where everyone could kick back and there was a pool and a few people got thrown in the pool. And we hired some staff to act as bartenders and had some good music, and uh, yeah, I think I think everybody had a really good time. At the same time, I think that it was when we lived here that Joe and I first started to experience that sense that this wasn't going to make us happy, that, you know, we had everything we could ask for in the world. We lived in a high rise, and we, we had every physical amenity that, that we could possibly have, and, you know, we drove a Jaguar, and, and we actually had a, um, there was this wonderful valet here in the building who would take it out and detail it and bring it back looking like it was something out of a showroom. And yet, there was always one more thing we needed. It was like, well, we'd be really happy if we had the bigger condo in the building or if, if there were a few more amenities at the gym or if Joe had a better job or if I had a better job. But it, when you were at Yale and the, you know, it, they were like, oh, we chose all of you because you're lifelong learners. Oh, no, that was a, that was a before you, we went off to Yale. In Houston, there was a Yale Alumni Society or whatever it's called, Yale Alumni Club, that had a little, yeah, would get together for students that were going off to Yale. And what they actually said was, you know, the one thing we all have in common here is they're all lifelong learners. That's why, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, I'm not a lifelong learner. I just want to be rich. I mean, like, <laughs> like, like I get in with all these lifelong Yeah, like, I just, I, I try to make straight A's because I want to make a lot of money. And I'm like, like that's, Plain and simple, that's what it was about. That's exactly how I thought about it. And I was just like, what does that even mean, a lifelong learner? Like, I'm gonna stop learning as soon as I can, right? You know, as soon as I get out of college, I'm not gonna work hard and study anymore because- My butler that, will learn things yeah, and tell me about I mean, it. Yeah, like, what's, isn't that the whole point here? You know, we learn stuff and then, you know, it's work, right? You don't work for nothing. It was really hard to leave the Westgate because we really loved it here. We loved the people. We, we loved having just really interesting neighbors that they had the most amazing stories of, you know, being in Texas politics for like 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years. And, you know, we loved having just the Capitol grounds. You walk outside the front door and everything was green and lush and there's acres and acres of just land right in the middle of downtown and you can walk to the entertainment district. And so when we moved to the Burbs, it, it was really, quite a shock, um, but, but I had begun seeking spiritually, and I think that God kind of gave me a grace that even though I didn't have all the excitement of downtown and then the beauty of you know our, our place here in the Westgate, I was ready 
to take a step back from everything and do some interior exploration. And I think it was at that moment that we realized we're just not gonna find happiness in this stuff. It was like a, this infinite quest that, that was never gonna end. And it would be a while until we found answers. But I think that that's when we first started to ask the question, what, what is going to make us happy if it's not this? We were ready to start researching kind of a, a different area of life than just how can we make more money and party more. I sort of got to the point where I was making a lot of money and then I had this strange transition to a, a much more sort of normal, uh, moderate lifestyle. And that change was really brought about by our uh, conversion, you know, our, our conversion to uh, Catholicism. I was always con had always considered myself a Christian, but really was very, very uh, lukewarm about it, to say the least. Um, and at the time that we became Catholic, there was, uh, I really just sort of let a lot of things go. I mean, I let go of a lot of worldly attachments and it felt really good. It felt very peaceful and just started taking every day as it came and not having grandiose plans and not working myself to death and just, just living. You know? and, it, and it was a very, very nice uh, transition. Um, headed to Abby Johnson's house. She actually lives just a few miles away from me, just across the highway. She is a, a former abortion clinic worker. She was a director at Planned Parenthood and had a profound conversion that led her to see what was really going on at Planned Parenthood and just kind of the horror of it all. And now she's dedicated her life to speaking out against the evils of, of the big abortion clinic. There are definitely a lot of stereotypes about Catholic women. I think one of them would be, you know, Catholic women don't have a sense of humor. You know, they're very dour and always like shaking their rosaries at people. Maybe they're, you know, not stylish, you know, walking around in, um, you know, maybe kind of dowdy clothes or floor length dresses or something. Subservient right. wife, yeah. right, in a homemade dress. In our little aprons, like, like yes sir. dress <laughs> with an yeah. apron, yeah. you know, um, with our wooden shoes right. and, you or know, no shoes. or no shoes. Yeah. I think the other one would be that maybe they're not like savvy towards the culture, you know, may, maybe they don't, um, you know, don't leave the house very often, don't um, have an eye for style or design or, you know, know what, what's going on with the latest movies. You, you blow dry parts and then you take breaks. It's the breaks that I have been missing. I want to write a book um, called God Talks Me Through My Hair Dryer. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, because I get all of these really inspired titles and moments. They come to me through my through my hair dryer. Yeah, but you said the breaks, right? Because we, cause we do it a section at a time. Right, one section and at then, a time. Yeah. Do a section and then I take a break and then I think of something. Oh, see, I'm gonna be, is, I need this for, cause I blog, you know, so I, I'm, I always need good material. So I'll have great hair and new blog posts. Yes. So yeah, oh, that's Write awesome. it down Yeah, 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 yeah. The worst evil was suffering. It was something that we atheists really did not have a very good lexicon for dealing with. And so, to my mind, the entire purpose of life was to minimize suffering. And this began to really extend into my political views, the idea of euthanasia. Like, well, if someone's suffering, best to go ahead and, and let them not suffer. Abortion, you know, like, well, if, if that child would have had a bad life, then frankly, better off dead, to put it bluntly because we feared, e even more than you know, we feared death or anything, we feared suffering. And so I very much optimized my life and my worldview around this fear and hatred of suffering. What's new with the ministry? Like, where do you stand? Um, so exciting things are happening. I mean, we, you know, I always knew that I wanted to work with clinic workers. I mean, when I left Planned Parenthood, I knew eventually this is what I'm going to want to do. I'm going to want to work with clinic workers, but I didn't know when that was going to happen. I did not know what it was going to look like. I didn't know how that was going to take shape. Even when I was first exploring Catholicism, I never told anyone this. I, I didn't even tell Joe this, but in the back of my mind, I thought that maybe I would just have to be 
a pro-choice Catholic or something, which I didn't like, but it was I, there was this weird disconnect of this church was right about everything. Every, every tough question I asked, the church had an answer for, and I was really coming to believe that it was guided by God. But there was this one issue because my thinking was, you know, they say that God is the source of all that is good, but an all good God would not oppose freedom. And I associated abortion with women's freedom. My book came out and really I don't I don't really like to write. So the only reason that I that I even considered writing the book was because I thought, okay, if if this can get into the hands of clinic workers, then it's worth it for me to do it. So because I, I was thinking to myself, okay, if I if I were still in the abortion business and someone had come out like me, then I would pick it up. Mm -hmm. I would pick up the book. I would read it. You just, I would read curiosity. It. I would read it as, yeah. a, as a critic. Yeah. Right? I would read it to say how wrong they were. Yeah. But I would pick it up. So I was thinking to myself, if these, if some people will pick it up, if some of these clinic workers will pick it up to read it as a critic, maybe they will find some truth in it somewhere, and maybe something will resonate with them, and maybe they'll contact me. I don't know. Maybe. Unfortunately, I, I have had very many friends who have had abortion and I literally gasped when I realized every single one of them was using contraception at the time that they conceived their children. Every single one of them had contraception fail and they, they thought they were doing the right thing. They were playing by society's rules, but society had told these women to go ahead and engage in the act that creates babies even if you feel like you are in absolutely no position to become a parent and then when their contraception failed you know abortion facilities were only too ready to tell them oh it's not really a baby we'll just give us your money and, and we'll make the problem go away and suddenly I realized that the key to women's freedom was not abortion but was rejection of contraception we ended up having 17 workers contact us. Wow. And so, and you know, these workers wanted to leave. And so Doug and I just said, okay, look, um, we're just going to take it upon ourselves to financially support these workers. Your own money? Mm hmm Wow. To transition them out and, you know, help them emotionally. And then they just, they kept coming. And so wow. we finally said, okay, we need to, <laughs> we need to get an organization yeah. started, you know. Yeah. Now she's actually started a new ministry called And Then There Were None, which directly reaches out to abortion clinic workers and helps them leave their jobs to find better occupations. I go out to the clinics and, and a lot of times there's sidewalk counselors out there and so I see them and they're so great, you know, with the women that are going in and out to have abortions and, you know, they stay and, the, you know, the women are coming out after their abortion. I just, I hear the compassion in their voice and I see the compassion on their faces and they're you know telling these women we're going to be here for you it's it's lovely what they're yeah. telling them it's beautiful and then i see the workers come out and it's like the compassion's gone. gone yeah and i just think oh my gosh you know number one 70 percent of people that work inside of, of the abortion industry have had abortions themselves oh wow so they need healing too Right? I mean, just like the women coming out that have just had abortions, they need that healing. But they are, they are dealing with something that is so powerful. They need so much healing. They need so much recovery. They need more compassion than anybody else from us. You know, I've never, I've never seen God in a real way, like in a visual way, but I feel like I have seen evil. Um, clinic workers, when they see abortion, you know, the, the remains of an abortion in a jar, they are seeing evil. You know, there is a certain smell about abortion and they are able to smell that. I feel like abortion clinic workers have seen Satan in a very sensory way. And they, it will take a lifetime to recover from that. You know, when we started this, I mean, I thought to myself, okay, in 40 years, I mean, abortion's been legal for almost 40 years in this country. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, in 40 years, surely 
there's already an organization like this out there yeah. because we've got you know thousands of pregnancy centers out there to help women in crisis pregnancies we've got you know hundreds of different groups for you know post-abortive women and men they're the they're like the lepers yeah yeah you know and uh, they are the untouchable yeah and that is so false right you know and that's why I tell people every clinic worker every abortionist everybody inside of those walls is reachable are you willing to develop to try to develop that trust with that worker yeah. you know that's what people did with me right. and you know here I am today I'm up early headed to the Vitae clinic and I think we might have some news today that the Vitae clinic is a totally pro-life ob -GYN center totally in line with Catholic teaching. I've heard so many good things about how they really seek to treat the whole woman rather than just you know throwing a drug at you know any medical condition without asking questions and I've had some bad experiences in the past with doctors who just don't care to hear about any real symptoms or try to learn what's going on with my body. They just push a prescription at me and you know, frankly kind of hope that I go away. And I've just heard amazing things about Dr. Calamarides and the work that he's doing to, to really help women, um, you know, as, as whole people. So I can't wait to uh, go and check it out. Lately I've been feeling, it, it just seems like I can't get enough sleep. I wake up in the morning and I'm just still tired and the other day I had a second cup of coffee which is nothing for me and I felt like I was going to throw up which is distressing. I'm up way early for an early appointment at the Vitae clinic. This is a totally pro-life medical clinic, no contraception, no artificial reproductive technologies, totally in line with Catholic teaching. It's part of the John Paul II Center. And the doctor there is just so great. I've heard so many good things about him. Hi, are you ready, Jen? Good morning. Good morning, hey, Hi. thanks for seeing me. Oh, that's, you're very welcome. Um, what I usually do when I first see a patient for confirmation is I go over, we go over your history a little, so I'm just going to sit down right here and we'll talk for a minute, okay? Great. What do you want to describe um, how you've been feeling? Have you had any fatigue? Yes, lots of fatigue, nausea. Have you had uh, any trouble with breathing at all? Um, you're not short of breath now? Mm -hmm. You're not having wheezing or sputum production? Yeah. No, no, no recent colds? We're pregnant. <laughs> So we have a 3D and 4D ultrasound, Ooh, so that's it's very exciting. We can see your baby moving in two dimensions, um, and we can also see your baby moving sometimes in three dimensions too, even at an early age. So this is very good, Jen. So we can go ahead and start your ultrasound. Great, right, I'm excited. Okay, so yeah. we have the baby inside here, and you can see our baby just a second ago. There. Oh, so right, right there. Oh, it's, it's amazing to think, you know, that same heart could be beating like 80 years from now. That's exactly what yeah, I think amazing. about too. When I look at these little people, yeah, and, and you know, it's just a small person. Oh, but they're growing and growing. And you can see here, you know, this is your baby's head now. I always have this dumb thing when I'm pregnant, where it's it's like, it's hard to imagine that it's real, you know? I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm gaining weight and, you know, I feel kind of sick, but it's like, really? There's really like a human in there? And so every time I see that first ultrasound and it's, it's the same reaction every time. It's just this profound moment of, of awe, of just like, wow. He has uh, some limb buds already oh. for the feet down here low. See, there's a foot yeah, there. look at that. Uh -huh. That's so and Usually cute. the arms are folded over the baby's <laughs> chest. So. Oh. So this is great. We can measure your baby and then see exactly if you correspond. It looks really good though. Your baby's upside down there. Oh, that's I'm just so freeze cute. This picture. This is, this is a person. This is a heart that could very well be beating 70, 80, 90 years from now. This is a heart that's gonna 
you know, go through an entire life with, you know, with, with someone's story. And um, it's, you know, I, I, was, I was just in awe when I saw that. That I've noticed with other women's health practices that I've been to, there's, there's really a culture of fear that if anything comes along, a, a problem arises, it's like, let's shut it down with medicine as fast as we can. And I like it that you guys take this more holistic approach of, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's look at your charts. Let's really listen to what your body is telling us. Because I've, you know, I, I've been going to secular women's health practices for years, and I, I really, um, and frankly, I'm just tired of you know having having my body just shut down with drugs rather than really listening to what it's trying to tell me. Here at the Mute Clinic, we, we want to be very clear. Like, if you have fear, we really want to eliminate that. Let's talk about the issue, and and um, and then resolve it. Because when people are fearful, then um, you, you have uh, sometimes even like it causes more pain and stuff. When I was eight months pregnant with my second child. I had a severe pain in my leg, which just kept getting worse and worse. I went to the ER and they were really freaked out because you can't really treat a DVT during pregnancy because the blunt thinning drugs wouldn't be, wouldn't be good for the baby either. I had a deep vein thrombosis with my second pregnancy, but because they couldn't treat it during pregnancy, I was actually not hospitalized for it. I was just put on Lovenox and told to keep my fingers crossed, <laughs> basically. You weren't actually in the hospital? No, they didn't hospitalize me. Okay. Um, how about, have you, that was actually during pregnancy? Yes. Did you have testing after pregnancy as to your risk for developing deep vein thrombosis again? Like Yes, and they found out, my, my hematologist can barely believe it, I, I have the factor two, um, a genetic blood clotting disorder and, and that's a lot you know there's factor five factor two is a, a lot more rare and I ha I'm homozygous I got oh, it from both you parents you know at the very last minute with no warning I had to see a high-risk OB and a hematologist and give myself shots every day and they were saying that I had to use contraception and I couldn't have any more kids and it, it was it was a really distressing situation especially that this was right in the middle of Joe and I converting to Catholicism. You know, when I first got diagnosed, um, I had all these doctors telling me, you have to be sterilized. There's just, there's no other choice. You, you can't have any more kids. And they made it sound very black and white, that like, you're, you're done. You can't have any more kids. And then when I came, my third pregnancy was actually very closely after the second one, where, where the DVT was. And I said, um, well, I'm having more kids, so what are we going to do about it? And interestingly, suddenly there were all these solutions. I was, I was actually not Catholic at the time, but I'd heard about charting, and, and I had actually been trying to chart my cycles, and I had found some really interesting things that were going on with my body, and this doctor just laughed at me. He, he was like, what, why would I care about seeing this chart? Take this drug, fill this prescription, and, and your symptoms will go away. There's a, there's a process in talking to the patient about any medical condition starting any medicine or doing any procedure, and that's called informed consent. Mm -hmm. And it's really the doctor's obligation to talk to you and give you their medical opinion, and also, you know, based on your condition that he finds or she finds, and then really to present you with the risks, benefits, the indications, and the alternatives mm -hmm. for anything. We, you know, this is, what we're very modern in our treatment, and, and luckily, in women's medicine, I think we are finding out that sometimes things aren't so black and white, that there are a lot of um, options as far as treatment um, based on uh, safety and uh, desire for you know, how you want to carry out your pregnancy, your birth, and you know, the postpartum time, right. too. Dr. Calamaridis, thank you so much. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you seeing me today. It, it's really our pleasure to take care of you, and um, you know, you should see your, we should see you, or whoever's going to see you at your next visit for um, in about four weeks. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you so and much. You're very welcome. And keep up the great work. You guys continue to be in our prayers. To finally see what Dr. Calamaridis is doing at his clinic, it's like, ah, oh, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. Someone who actually wants to take the time to like look at what's going on with my body and you know really take a clear look at my symptoms and and treat me as a whole person and it was just ah oh, like this is what i have been waiting for in medical care wow 
six kids, huh? Like, who <laughs> get already a little chaotic with five. Not sure what we were thinking here. So, um, and of course I was happy. And, and I go through this every time. Like, while I'm pregnant, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know, I don't know. This, this might have been a really bad idea. And then, of course, as soon as the baby gets here, it's like, this child was meant to be part of our family. But I kind of did have that pang of like, Ooh, six. That's that's a that's a lot of kids. <laughs> um, so Joe and I recently found out we're expecting number six. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. And you know our oldest is just about to turn eight, so that's you know yeah. pretty closely spaced there. And you know we we definitely felt called you know to. Um, you know, be, be open to life. Um, we, we didn't feel like we had grave or serious reasons, um, you know, to, to avoid new life. And, but now, um, this morning, I went down to the Vitae Clinic and saw Dr. Calvin Reedes, and it was amazing, it was just a great experience. Um, but what's funny is, like, when I saw the ultrasound, and, you know, the, the baby was actually moving a little bit already at, at eight weeks, you could see wow. the little arms moving, it, it was amazing. And so it was this, you know, moment of profound gratitude combined with worry you know like mm. there's something about realizing that, that this is a, you know real human being that suddenly I'm thinking well am I really up to this I mean six that's a big number you know mm -hmm. and, and you know we have a small house and we have a lot of other kids and you know I do you just do you have any advice is that well is that normal that I would you know suddenly like now now that the baby's here I'm, I'm suddenly like oh maybe maybe this was a terrible <laughs> idea and just you know does, does that make me a bad Catholic or something but I'm you know that I did I was profoundly grateful but I sure. did have that feeling of like what have we gotten ourselves into uh -huh. is that normal <laughs> I'm sure it is you would you would probably know better than I am from the other moms that you talk to yeah um, it's more, you know, it's it's more a little bit more chaos, yeah, <laughs> um, a little bit more uh, kind of coordinating of schedules and and uh, just feedings and changing diapers and all that. Um, I would say the most important thing is is with the anxiety is to take that to the Lord. Have you brought it in prayer? Have you talked to Him about it? No. <laughs> Why do I never think of that? You're not the only one. I give it, you know, blog readers, I'm like, well, you need to pray about it, and then I'm freaking out. I'm not praying about it. You know, it's the biggest no-brainer, but it's the same thing happens to me. I go yeah. to my spiritual director, and I say, oh, this prayer is this way, and this is this, and have you talked to the Lord about it? No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, bring it to Him, um, and just, just honestly, you know, what, what you're feeling, what's going on. Um, the gratitude also, you know, bring that and share that with him. Allow him to, to be with you in, in the gratitude okay. um, and just in the joy and the beauty of a new child, um, which I'm sure those are, the, those are the strongest feelings. Oh, uh, right. At least Absolutely. most of the time. Yeah. Um, but also the, the, the anxiety, whatever fear is there. I was so happy to meet with Father Rhea because I just got into this point where I, I felt so overwhelmed by everything in my life that it was like, I didn't even know what questions I should be asking anymore. I, I just, it just felt like everything was snowballing. I knew that I wasn't advancing in my spiritual life, but I didn't know which way to turn. And I feel so much better. As always, he just gave me exactly the advice I needed to hear. And I just, I feel like I, I know what I need to do now. <laughs> when people see me out with the kids and you know they see that I have a big big family and sometimes they'll say oh you must be Catholic <laughs> I always I feel kind of bad that we're, we're perpetuating this stereotype and I always want to say no 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 like you do not have to have a huge family like we do in order to be Catholic like good Catholic families they can have one kid they can have no kids they can have 15 kids like it is not at all about a number it's just about being open and you know honestly seeking God's will for for what the right family size is for you I, I'd never had an ultrasound that was that clear at, at the eight week mark and so to be able to actually see this little person moving around it was it was amazing it was a really really profound moment I didn't think that I wanted children when I was younger <laughs> oh yeah I think the kids are going to be excited to find out that they're having a new little brother or sister. I know that my son will be hoping for another boy since he's the oldest and then hi. 
and then we had four girls in a row. But, you know, we'll be happy with whoever God gives us. So we went down to the Vitae Clinic today, All right. and that's awesome. Their staff is just so awesome. It was like the most pleasant medical visit I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it turns out we our suspicions were right, and we're pregnant. All right. I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, seeing the ultrasound and, you know, seeing that little person. You know, I did have a flash of like, wow. Six. That's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, we saw uh, the little arms moving and stuff. It was really, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he said it had a really strong heartbeat and it, everything looked great. Is that a boy there. or a girl? <laughs> it's um, hard to say. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so <laughs> can't really see much. So yeah. And if we have five girls, then we'll have a whole female basketball team. Boy would be great. Boy would be great because we will have four teenage girls in the house at once already, and that's 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 a lot. Were you recruited for high school basketball? I didn't play it. Though. No, you didn't play, but you were recruited. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I was too busy. Like I had goth music to listen to, and my nose ring, and my green hair. I told God too that um, four girls in a row, it's we're we're due for for another boy. So. Yeah, that would be great. God owes me another boy. <laughs> I, I absolutely want a boy. Um, obviously, we're you know we're blessed either way. But um, yeah, I, I told God that uh, he, he really owes me. Also, we're gonna have four teenage girls in the house at once. I, I can't do five at once. <laughs> are you are you worried about having <laughs> having six and just you know nope. all the chaos? No, not really. I like to ruminate on everything <laughs> that could go wrong and um, how our, you know, what our kids will be telling their psychotherapists, you know, 20 years from now. And um, but you don't, <laughs> you don't have no. that doesn't keep you up at night. I think it'll be fine. <laughs> it'll right. all work out. The Christian life is always the way of the cross. And the cross does mean sacrifices, and it does mean that you're gonna feel some pain sometime, and that there are going to be those days when you're like, wow, you know, this, this life that I'm living, <laughs> this, is, this is a life of self-denial, <laughs> you know, no joke, no kidding. But the cross is also the way to joy. And I think that that's what people are missing, is that you know, yeah, we, we have those, you know, really difficult times. And, and I think that, you know, we definitely feel that, you know, those of us who have, you know, young children, especially, I think, you know, you, you really feel that, that the self-denial of, of the Christian life. And yet you also see that, that joy and, and you experience that. And that's something that Joe and I have both found and why, you know, that, that life that we lived at, at the Westgate, you know, driving the Jaguar and, you know, living in the high rise and, and just that, that whole lifestyle, we don't miss it for a second. When I grew up, you know, growing up in a very quiet sort of environment, what I wanted to do was become rich and create like, uh, the way I see it now is what I was really trying to create was like a museum kind of experience. I was going to have a really nice house with really nice cars, but it was all going to be in perfect order all the time. And I see now that that's just another form of death, you know, or at least absence of life. You know what I mean? It's just, it's quiet there and it's, everything's perfect. And it's not like that in our house, you know, in our house, it's very noisy and everything's always messy. And, and that's, and life is that way, you know, life is messy and, and noisy. And we would never, you know, if we could wave a magic wand, we would never even consider going back to that life. And, and I think every single Catholic woman I know feels that way, none of them for an instant miss those days, you know, when, when they didn't have a big family and, you know, when, when they were just a single woman. They, they might occasionally think, boy, that was nice when I could, you know, finish a book without being interrupted 50 times, but they never yearn for the entire package of that lifestyle. And I think it's because they found, what I found is, you know, the Christian life is the way of the cross, but it's also the way of joy. I just got back from the doctor and we found out the gender of this baby. For those of you who need a little refresher, we our first was a boy and then we had four girls in a row. So with this baby number six, we were, you know, thinking it would maybe be nice to get a little change and we found out that it is a boy. So we are very, very excited. It's been eight years since we had a boy and uh, the whole family's thrilled. Ted Weinstein is my literary agent, and he was the one who said, 
let's turn this into a memoir. So that was back in 2008 and he's been with me the whole way and I have learned so much from him. The issue is primarily what detail you're highlighting. Okay. This book that people will finally see, it's not my first book, it's like my fourth book. It just so happens that I've rewritten the same story four times. I think he's kind of taking a chance on this one because it's definitely not the kind of thing he normally represents. So I'm really hoping to go with a secular publisher, maybe one of the bigger publishers. Joe has pointed out that there's, I have this, it's not exactly a split personality. Joe calls him subconscious Ted and I walk around having arguments with my subconscious agent because Ted's going to hate it. He's going to hate it. And he's going to probably hate me by extension. I'm going to be put on a blacklist. Well, I thought that chapter was good, and I know you think it's too long, but I had to make it that long, because I, I had to explain the backstory, and you can't have that chapter without backstory. But we're talking about Ted Weissheim. Every one of his clients, he pushes to make their work better. You know? I agree. So, you know, he's just, he's just good. Four to five years of intense work, not only for me, but for our whole family. Everything I've studied, everything I've learned, the stack of books this high that I've read to learn how to be a better writer, the edits I've gone through. I've had seven different people read it. Innumerable revisions. I think this book is making me slightly insane. You know, I've told Ted that this is my final offer, that I'm not, I, I just can't rewrite it again. Uh, the big call with Ted is tomorrow. Oh, good. And um, if Ted doesn't represent it, uh, I'll, I'll probably cry. I'd really be pretty crushed. Okay, this is it. I really want him to represent this book. Hey, Ted.